Welcome to part two of the Art for the Earth project. If you missed part one, you can view it at any time by visiting the Art for the Earth Facebook page. And if you'd like to follow along or learn more about each piece, you can view our digital program on that page as well. The Art for the Earth project embraces the arts, culture, community, and science all working together. After all, in a world with interdisciplinary challenges, we need interdisciplinary solutions. The roots that connect the arts and sciences are nourished by our communities and cultures, and the heart of this project is to take action within our communities in support of a clean and healthful environment. Many of our actions stem from our relationships with the world around us. In Caroline Patterson's poem, Fragile, she speaks of her relationship to sandhill cranes at a small lake in Montana. Caroline writes about her poem, Because of climate change, the territories of sandhill cranes are changing, which made it possible to watch the nesting cranes. As I wrote, I became fascinated with the idea of eggs, fragility, and cracking as a metaphor for ourselves and for the earth as we undergo global change. My name is Carolyn Patterson, and the name of my poem is Fragile. Fragile as bone china, the teacup your great aunt gave you, the thin porcelain, and the way when held to the light, its fissures appear like an eggshell, a hole made of hexagonal shards that become visible when broken. We watch each other in May, the sandhill crane on its nest in the marsh, steady as cattails, visible, only by its red crown, me on my cabin deck, steady as tamarack, visible by my black binoculars. It chortles in evening when the maid appears and they change places, one at the nest, the other flying off, its large gray wings sweeping across sky. The loons, red-winged blackbirds, gone temporarily silent. This small northern lake is new territory for these sandhill cranes. This waiting is new territory for me, watching day after day for tapping from within these eggs, watching for the telltale cracking, for those long-legged yellow fuzzy babies called colts that look like an English children's illustration to emerge. But each evening, I only hear the birds call, a sound like hollow sticks rattling, a blood sound old as the rising, hopping, skipping, mating dance that will bind the two birds together for life and fragile for the way that it exposes the fissures in us, in our world. There is hope in these broken places. I never see the colts until four months later, two young cranes fly out from the marsh and across the lake, their reflections white and rumpled in the green-black water. We are inside that egg, this earth, tapping, waiting, tapping again, waiting to emerge through the cracks, through the thin translucent walls, waiting to emerge, waiting. It's amazing to think that we can connect so strongly to an entire system through the life cycle of one species. There is an undeniable fragility across the earth right now as species struggle to adapt to a quickly changing world. But as Caroline said, there is hope in these broken places, and I believe that hope starts with a strengthening of our connection to the world around us. The next piece is titled Plastic, A Life Cycle of Harm by Yupa Stein. It is an exploration of the toxic absurdity of plastic with plastic costume characters and Montana landscapes. In a description about her piece, Yupa said that a couple years ago she started collecting the non-recyclable plastic from her home, and at the same time, she started saving articles and research about plastic, which led her to ask, what is more absurd? Saving and making weird stuff out of plastic? Or our normalized production and everyday bombardment of single-use plastic and plastic packaging? Baby fish are filling their tiny bellies with shards of plastic. In fish nurseries off the coast of Hawaii, plastics outnumber baby fish seven to one. A thousand pieces of plastic debris were found in the stomach of an endangered sperm whale that washed up in Indonesia. Officials found 19 pieces of hard plastic, four whole plastic bottles, 25 plastic bags, two flip-flops, 115 plastic cups, and 1,000 pieces of plastic string. 
An estimated five tons of plastic are fed to albatross chicks each year at Midway Atoll. Over 90% of the approximately 320,000 chicks that hatch each year on the atoll contain plastic in their stomachs, and it's estimated that half of them will die because of it. It's estimated that by 2050, 99% of all seabird species will be ingesting plastic. A study from northern France has found that periwinkle snails living in microplastic-infused water fail to respond appropriately when hunted by a crab. It appears that the toxins in microplastics inhibit the chemical cues that would normally help a snail know what to do when hunted by a crab. A study documented trash on two islands in the South Pacific. They found 414 million pieces of garbage, most of it plastic. The researchers found around 61,000 Henderson Island crabs and 508,000 crabs on the Cocos Keeling Islands are estimated to become entrapped in debris and die every year. The crabs use the odor of dead crabs to scope out available shells. So once one has crawled into a plastic container and becomes trapped, it eventually dies and attracts more to the trap. Plastic particles have been found in the guts of tiny animals living at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point on Earth. The researchers found that 72% of the total samples of the amphipods they studied contained plastic fibers and fragments in their guts. The plastic particles are concerning because these can attract PCBs and other toxins, and they can leach chemicals of their own. The physical presence of particles in a tiny creature's belly creates disruptions, blocking its digestive tract and impeding mobility. Some of these stories may seem like they're from places far away from those of us in Montana, but scientists found more than 1,000 tons of microplastics are deposited onto protected lands in the Western United States each year equivalent to more than 123 million plastic water bottles. A visiting Chinese researcher working with the University of Montana's Flathead Lake Biological Station found microplastics in the samples collected at 12 sites along Flathead Lake. Research from Montana State University found microplastics contaminate Montana snow and rain. The study found fibers, polyester, and other pieces of microplastic in dozens of snow samples taken from Big Sky Resort, Teton Pass, and other Rocky Mountain sites. The Gallatin Microplastics Initiative surveyed microplastics contamination in the watershed of Montana's Gallatin River. 72 sample locations were seasonally sampled for two consecutive years. 774 total samples were collected. 57% of Gallatin samples contained microplastic pollution. In a study during the summer of 2019, Environment Montana tested samples from 50 fishing access points across Montana. They found tiny bits of plastic in almost 70% of those water bodies. Everywhere scientists have looked, they have found plastic, including the Arctic, the top of remote mountains, beer, salt, and in river food web systems where birds like dippers feed microplastic contaminated insects to their young. Microplastics bioaccumulate and move through the food chain. One study found that the fruits and vegetables we eat, including apples, carrots, and lettuces, are being contaminated with microplastics by absorbing microplastics through their roots. Scientists have detected micro and nanoplastic particles in human tissues and organs in the form of monomers, the small molecules that react together to make plastic. Plastic pollutes at every stage of its life cycle, from extraction and production to when it becomes waste, and it disproportionately harms people of color and marginalized people in economically depressed areas around the world including Harrisburg, Manchester, and East Houston, Texas, where the airborne concentration of 1,3-butadiene, a building block chemical used in the manufacturing of plastic, is more than 150 times greater, and residents are 22 times more likely to develop cancer when compared to the wealthier and predominantly white West Houston communities. 
79% of the 73 incinerators in the U.S. are located in low-income communities and or communities of color, like Chester City, Pennsylvania, where 200 tons of recycling material is burned in the huge Covanta incinerator every day, and the rate of ovarian cancer is 64% higher, and lung cancer is 24% higher than the rest of Pennsylvania. There are many communities in the world where wealthier countries send their plastic waste, like the one in Malaysia where Lily Binti Kamal's house is next to a plastic recycling factory. When she grew up there, her house was surrounded by forests. She used to fish in the creeks, and now the water and air is too polluted for her children to fish or even go outside. We are on a path of doubling plastic production in the next 20 years, a path of more and more consumption, accepting that it is okay to sacrifice some lives and that there are lives with less value. Can we create a path shaped by the understanding that there is no less important life? Our current production premise is that nature is an endless supply of resources for us to exploit. Can we act on behalf of diverse ecosystems and living beings small and large? Can we create a responsible, regenerative path? Can we acknowledge that nature has value for its own sake, in its own right, and accept our responsibility to protect the rights of nature? What we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. We are interdependent and bound together. We have to change our relationship to plastic. It's going to require governments to regulate, businesses to innovate and individuals to act. Much of the plastic we produce is designed to be thrown away after being used only once. As a result, plastic packaging accounts for about half of the plastic waste in the world. Extended producer responsibility will be an essential part of solving our plastic mess, but you can also help by refusing some common single-use plastic items. Here are just a couple examples. One million plastic bottles are bought every minute, and we create and throw away 16 billion coffee cups a year. You can help by drinking beverages from a reusable cup or bottle. Plastic straws are currently the fourth most found ocean trash in cleanups by quantity. It's estimated that 437 million to 8.3 billion plastic straws are on the world's coastlines. Unless you need one, please stop using plastic straws. It's estimated that if you tied together the number of plastic bags consumed in the world every minute, they would circle the world seven times every hour. If it's possible for you, you can help by using reusable grocery bags and reusable bags for fruits and vegetables. Any way you can reduce your use of single-use plastics will make a difference. Talk to the people in your life and the places where you shop about your zero-waste efforts. Here are a couple other suggestions for action. If you live in the United States, ask your representatives and senators to support the Break Free from Plastic Act, sponsored by Senator Tom Udall and Representative Alan Lowenthal. For more information, check out some of the groups working on plastic pollution, Surf Rider Foundation, Plastic Pollution Coalition, Break Free from Plastic, The Story of Stuff, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, and Greenpeace. As Anne-Marie Bonneau says, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Do what you can.
The resource page of the Missoula 0x50 website is an excellent way to stay informed of recycling and reuse options for plastics and other materials in Missoula. For example, you'll find that you can recycle clear number one and translucent number two plastics at the Republic Services drop-off recycling center. Unlike most other plastic, there's a current market for these two plastics. Most other plastic is being incinerated, buried, or shipped to other places that are less able to manage it. So it's best to avoid those plastics whenever you can. The Missoula 0x50 website is a community resource and needs the community to keep it updated. If you have any updates, please use the contact page to share them. For more information about 0x50, please visit the website. There is also information and a list of actions on the last page of the Arts for the Earth Project virtual program. The connection between climate change in plastic might not be obvious until we start thinking about plastic over its lifetime. New plastic is made from oil, gas, and coal, which contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And at the end of the plastic life cycle, plastic incineration contributes to emissions as well. One way that you can make a difference as an individual is by supporting businesses that make environmentally friendly choices in their practices. Green Source is a business local to Missoula making the eco-friendly choice to not use plastic. Hi everyone, I am Jess. I own Green Source Juice Bar on the Hip Strip in Missoula. We've been open for four years, and when we first opened, we were bottling our cold pressed juice in plastic bottles. Our intention was always to move to glass. Last winter, I took a trip to Kauai, stepped out onto the beach, onto a huge pile of plastic. It's devastating and heartbreaking, and I made the choice in that moment to switch to glass immediately and have no more single-use plastic in our restaurant. Other local businesses with eco-friendly practices include those that allow buying food in bulk without packaging, like the Good Food Store, Albertsons, Butterfly Herbs, Rosars, and Patty Creek Market. Another way to conserve resources and pollute less is to recycle your glass. Next up, we have a video from Recycling Works, a curbside glass and organics recycling service in Missoula. Think glass belongs in the trash? Think again. Glass is actually 100% recyclable meaning there's no loss in quality when that old mason jar becomes a new bottle. Recycling Works is the only glass recycling service in Western Montana that offers curbside pickup. We also hold quarterly glass drop-off events in Missoula to ensure everyone in the community can make the ethical choice for themselves and the environment. To learn more about glass recycling in Montana and to sign up, visit RecyclingWorksMT.com. Reusing materials like glass that don't lose quality in the recycling process is one way that humans can stretch finite resources into one's lasting lifetimes. But resources like other species are not able to be reused so easily. The next piece by contemporary artist Corky Claremont titled The Price Tag is a print reflecting upon extinction and the over-harvested pangolin. Uh, this is another piece that's uh, a little different. This is a uh, um, piece dealing with the pangolin, which is going extinct because it's being overly harvested. So it's just to bring an awareness of, uh, of that animal that's being destroyed. And, and it's uh, just kind of an ongoing issue with our, with our animals. You know, they, they're just not uh, uh, being considered in the development of, of, uh, of our contemporary uh, uh, needs or products and uh, they, they're going extinct. And as they go extinct, we eventually are on the same path. You know, we're on the path of extinction as well. And it hurts because uh, within our tribal community, you now we have great reverence for all animals and all plants because we believe that they were here before we came and they, in essence, prepared the way for us to be here. So we always owe them a great debt of respect and uh, an honor. So we treat those things uh, with reverence. So when you see animals being destroyed like that, 
it, uh, it hurts. The over-exploitation and habitat encroachment of species like pangolins not only hurts them, but hurts us as well. There is a cultural hurt and emotional hurt, but also a very real physical hurt in the emergence of infectious diseases like COVID-19. The health and happiness of our species is intricately linked to that of others, and this piece reminded us of just that. The biodiversity of species on Earth includes everything from pangolins to the tiny organisms that break down organic waste. Soil Cycle is a nonprofit organization that recognizes the power of these small but mighty species and empowers our community members to see organic matter as a valuable and important part of the food cycle. They offer sustainable zero waste services and programs focused on reducing organic waste, diverting valuable materials from the landfill, educating the community, and creating quality natural fertilizers. Food waste is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases. This idea to reduce food waste and use sustainable transportation was born out of the idea that I wanted to start an organization that didn't create more waste. Using bikes to do that seemed like a good idea. Right when I was coming up with the idea and starting Soil Cycle, the city was also working towards zero waste. We have a crisis right in our world and people want to make change. People have good intentions. Approaching something like zero waste is a really overwhelming concept that almost seems unachievable. I do believe that individuals can make a difference and it doesn't have to be something grandiose. I live in a small place, it's a studio with my dog, and there's barely any room to have my food scrap bin and my recycling bin and my landfill bin. And having a place to come like Soil Cycle that is nearby and it's so welcoming, it makes the whole process so easy for me. Everything we do is human powered. A lot of people think we're, we're crazy. What a strain on your back. And it's so slow and it's not efficient, but I see it as an opportunity to get people's hands in the dirt. So much like you eat all year round, um, we pick up food scraps all year round. And in Western Montana, that can mean a lot of inclement weather. It takes a lot of grit and a lot of perseverance, but I think that's what environmental change needs. So it comes down to empowerment and education composting workshops, outreach in schools, field trips. For me, volunteering and having people come actually build compost piles, turn compost piles, do all the things that are the human powered aspects is one of the biggest educational components to utilize here. Uh, I like to think that our members are also empowered to be doing something that's easy for them, but also sustainable for the earth. I love being able to get my compost here at the end of the summer. It's been really, really great for me to have a place to not only bring my food scraps, but to continue to grow as a gardener, to be self-sufficient in how I produce my own food and take care of my food waste. So I can get into the nitty gritty and the chemistry behind what happens in a compost pile, and I'm happy to nerd out about that. But when it really comes to the mission of Soil Cycle, it is to change mindsets. Someday we will not be here as an organization, but if we can inspire individuals in the moment to reduce their waste and look at nature and their relationship with it, then our job has been done.
There are so many ways that we can use the expertise and help of organizations like Soil Cycle to make a difference daily. Differences that over time can add up to global change. If you're interested in composting and would like to know about other Missoula options, you can visit the yard and garden section of the 0x50 Missoula website. Regenerative soil practices allow the carbon inside of organic waste to move back into the soil, where it can stay sequestered instead of contributing to global warming in the atmosphere. And it's not just nonprofits that can get in on sustainable and repurpose agricultural practices. Some of these actionable solutions can happen right at home as well. 1000 New Gardens is a student-led group promoting household organic vegetable gardening on land that has been underused or planted as lawn. I'm Bianca and I'm the 2020 president of 1000 New Gardens. Um, 1000 New Gardens is a student group here at UM and we um, build gardens around town. The goal is to build a thousand new gardens. This work is important. We're fighting against um, food insecurity. We're trying to provide people with independence from the food system and really give that autonomy back to the people, show them that they can grow their food and they should be growing their food and it's easier than you might think it is. Starting your own garden at home is always a good way to help out in your own way with just the overall mission but we are also always looking for more volunteers We've really evolved in the last few years. Now we're doing a lot of different things, landscaping, building raised beds, um, hosting food related events around the community and things like that. It's amazing how land can completely transform with just some creativity and effort. Organizations like 1000 New Gardens and other community garden resources like Garden City Harvest have transformed pieces of land around Missoula into community gardens and neighborhood farms, all contributing to a local and sustainable food supply. Growing food locally not only contributes to food security, but also boosts soil health. Keeping our diets closer to home also reduces emissions that come from the transportation of distant products. What we know about these things like carbon storage, gardens, and soil health comes from a long line of various sources of knowledge and science. In Knitting the Stories of Science, Ricky Van Berkham knits to highlight the importance of scientific evidence. Writing about her work, Ricky says, By incorporating scientific information into hand-knit art, I encourage people to think seriously about science and its value in our daily lives. Knowledge is power, and we need to harness all the power we can to make a better future. I'm Ricky Van Berkham. I'm a lifelong scientist, artist, and knitter. My work addresses my concerns about the devaluation of science and data that I've seen over the past few years. My work presents scientific research using the traditional handcraft of knitting. I create the designs, dye most of the yarns, and knit each piece by hand. I like the juxtaposition of the hard data and the comfort of the yarn. This chart shows the average global temperatures each year from 1880 to 2019. Each line in this chart shows how that year's average temperature compared to the average temperatures of the 1900s. Blue lines are cooler than average. The red lines are warmer than average. This transition here took place in, about, in the late 70s. Every decade since 1960 has been warmer than the previous one. Scientists use these data to carefully examine the causes of this temperature rise, including natural causes such as volcanic eruptions and variations in the Earth's orbit. By far the most important cause is greenhouse gases emitted by human activities. This chart is based on data from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. This map shows that the high average temperatures of the previous chart, this one from 2019, are not evenly distributed around the globe. Darker areas show where the temperature increases were the greatest. As you can see, the Arctic around the North Pole shows some of the greatest temperature increases averaging an increase of 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Yellow areas, which include most of our oceans, show increases of 1 to 2 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The blue areas indicate mild cooling. The high temperatures of the poles have impacts that affect the rest of the world, causing sea level rise, changes in weather patterns and ocean currents, and melting of the permafrost. This map is looking down on the North Pole. It shows the extent of the Arctic sea ice and how it has changed since 1980 as a result of warming temperatures. In 1980, sea ice covered the entire colored area. 20 years later, in 2000, the green area had melted. 19 years after that, in 2019, only the pink area remained, representing a loss of 38% of the Arctic sea ice. Melting sea ice does not raise sea levels. Only melting land ice does that. But the newly opened dark waters trap much more heat than the white reflective ice that was lost, causing the water to warm and causing more ice loss. This is based on data from NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This chart starts in 1970 and goes to 2018, and over here we see bird population size declining. So this dark line shows that bird populations declined over those years by 3 billion individual birds. So there are 3 billion fewer birds now than there were in 1970. This drop in bird numbers is a 30% decline in total bird population. This decline includes birds that are particular about where they live, as well as birds that can live pretty much everywhere, including introduced species such as starlings and house sparrows. The drop in bird numbers is caused by habitat loss, climate change, and probably even domestic cats. The chart is based on data published in the journal Science. My challenge as an artist is to create pieces that are appealing and welcoming to non-scientists and scientists alike. I strive to present only the strongest and clearest science in my pieces. I always read the original peer-reviewed publications that present the data and often consult with other scientists and statisticians. You can see my artwork and the sources of my data on my website, vanberkhamfiberart.com. There are so many kinds of storytelling, and data visualization is definitely one of my favorites. I'm inspired by the stories being told in the Art for the Earth project and hope that they speak to you as well. While Ricky uses knitting to explore the endangerment of bird species, our final piece does so by way of poetry, song, and dance. Going Going Gone, Last Call for Five Birds by Emily Club with choreography by Amy Ragsdale tells the stories of five extinct or endangered birds. About the origin of this piece, Emily wrote, A few years ago, I returned to Missoula to care for my folks during the last few years of their life. I happened to catch a call for artists circulating for the Art for the Earth project and casually mentioned to my mother an idea that popped into my mind about writing vocal music for endangered birds. This fleeting fancy quickly faded until just before her passing, my mother said, Sing your music, Emily. Just do it. Emily dedicates this piece to her mother, Valerie Club. Philippine Eagle, silent, stoic, still, one leg tethered to the weathered trunk of an ancient tree, talons digging deep into dead wood that once drew sap, stood tall, towered over other trees. The Philippine Eagle, regal, robed in dark wings wrapped around a white breast, hooked beak, copper crown, eyes forced open in a fixed stare, cloaked shut by an invisible curtain, cutting off the curious crowd, expecting a per performance, a jolt, a gesture, 
at least a glimpse of gratitude for the privilege of being preserved, kept, fed, printed on the back of a national coin, but the bird's black pupils absorb all energy, air, light, and life within the closed circle around him. Pulling the present back into his brain, where his past lives in the wild he once ruled. Muscle memory begins to stir, unwrapping majestic wings. Feathered fingers reach for freedom, tail fanned wide to trap wind. Headdress rises erect, proud, pulse pounding against its ribcage, pleading to be let out. Powerful tendons tug, pull, pull against the grip of gravity until sprung free into flight. Wings pushing, pushing up, out, faster, farther, feeding on speed as if riding Apollo's mythical spear, slicing through the atmosphere, arcing over clouds, carving sky into clean curves, swerves, swoops, dips, dives, glides, slides. The full feel of flying fills his lungs. Exhilaration, extension, expansion, suspension. Almost unbearable bliss. Then sweet release. A slow, smooth landing, soft as chicks down, onto the crown of a towering throne where he was born to be. A brief pocket of perfection. A boy with a sharp stick prods, pokes, punctures through the thin membrane of memory, yanking the eagle back to the present, tied to a stump a public stage, cage, rage, rage, raw rage rises, roars up acidic, white with heat, ripping out in a scream meant to slice his own throat, finally setting him free. But the sound suffocates in stale air, instantly strangled into a horrified gasp that draws no blood, falls impotent at the feet of the people in the crowd, who cheer and clap for this unexpected thrill. The boy with the stick stands up front, flushed with pride at his sudden power to provoke a response from such a regal, reticent, private bird.
Martha. Once, a river of heartbeats would suddenly flood the sky, eclipse the sun, drown the days into suspended twilight. Wave upon wave of thundering wings rain down a flutter of feathers, blue-brown with shimmers of pink, purple, and green. A blare of a billion trumpets splashed the air, washing over all sound. As this river of birds tumbled through, it fertilized the forests, fields, meadows, and marsh, owning the entire patch of earth and sky until the last passenger pigeon of the flock flew over the horizon to claim the sun on the other side. Through centuries, this avian river ran, winding its way around North America, until this prolific pigeons were discovered to be particularly delicious and easy sport. Drop by drop by drop, billions of birds hunted down to thousands, hundreds, two, then one tiny heartbeat curled up in a fatherless egg, incubated in a glass box until the fragile shell broke open and out stepped a wet, shivering, featherless chick named Martha, a gift to the Cincinnati Zoo, left to live her life staring through a metal screen at a stream of strangers passing, each one pausing for just a moment to stare at Martha staring back at them with fearless, defiant eyes. Did the spirits of her ancestors crowd into her cage in a whispering rush, welcome her to their lost world? Nest her in the sprawling canopy of the family tree? Warm her in their breasts of belonging? Comfort her with cooing lullabies? Feed the feel of freedom? into her hungry beak, take her under wing, lift her up to touch the sky, to fly in her dreams. Until at last, in the shadow of night, when no one was watching, her spirit slipped free, joined her waiting flock, and flew the north wind home, leaving an empty body behind to be inspected dissected, stuffed, fluffed, posed, and preserved inside an airless dome of glass labeled Martha, then propped up on a musty, dusty museum shelf. I hope, I hope she is home. I hope she has finally found her place secure in the eternal river of her flock, the last passenger pigeon to fly over to the other side.
the dodo. A hopelessly lost flock of panicky pigeons flapping over and around the wide open ocean east of Madagascar find themselves tumbling into wonderland. An island paradise flush with plants, nuts, flowers, and fruit. Home to giant trees, tortoises, and exotic slow-moving creatures. A peaceful, pleasant place, free of people or other large flesh-eating predators. With no need for fear, fight, or flight, these fortunate pigeons prosper, eventually evolving into well-fed, overgrown chicks with fuzzy feathers, feeble wings, a bulbous beak, and a teapot body set on thick mustard-colored legs, fat feet planted firmly on the ground. As a frivolous afterthought, curly plumage, coyly accent, and ample bum. In time, their high-strung pigeon screams settle into comfortable chuckles, rolling and rhythmical. The dodo moseyed about this fertile garden, foraging for food. Its favorite, from the tambalacock tree, with which it forms a circle dance of mutual reliance. The dodo digests the tree's fruit, scrubbing the seeds clean as they wind their way through to the other side, dropping into loamy soil, primed and ready to sprout, providing more fruit for the dodo to feed on. Every now and then, this laid-back bird had the luxury of laying one large egg, lovingly cradled in piles of palm leaves and carefully tended by two parents. Stranded out at sea, safe in this bubble of Eden, the dodo lives a simple, balanced life until Dutch sailors in search of spice crash their ships on shore, crushing the island's fragile shell, spilling out an army of rough boots, kicking through smooth sand, trampling over tender ferns and flowers, chopping trees, grabbing fruit, stuffing insatiable appetites, and hoarding leftovers for profit or sport. Curious and gullible, the dodo waddled up to welcome these strange guests. But clueless to the cruel fact that in these strangers' carnivorous eyes, the dodo was merely seen as meat to eat, slaughter, strip, slice, dice, salt, and store in the dank, stinking bellies of ships, soon to sail off to dangerous places. In a devastatingly short span of time, the dodo disappeared from the face of the earth, leaving behind a dried head, a shriveled foot, and tall tails that to this day still spark our imagination. While sending out a persistent siren to our selfish species, that we have the stain of preventable extinction on our careless hands.
Kauaio, last lonely only, left alone, singing love songs, over, around, and through ocean-misted mountains, lush tropical forests dripping sweet fruit, a solo seeking a two, a three, a we, another other, a date, a dance, duet, longing rising fresh each morning, let loose from a fretful sleep, to seek a Juliet, a nest to build and fill with fragile future, a little bird with a large voice, dressed in his best, slick black with saffron pantaloons, fluffing up his finest feathers, Dusting off yesterday's disappointment. Hopefully hopping limb to limb. Sleek beak open wide, pouring out burning, yearning bravado and persistence. Up through the flute of his throat, silky liquid legato. Nectar sweetened strands floated over the forest. Slipping, sliding, licking at the kite tails of a fickle breeze, winding through webs of trees, fluttering leaves like wind chimes, scattering loose staccato notes, clean and clear, dripping tears, dropping, plopping down hot lava rock, a kaleidoscope of sound strung together into music meant to melt the heart of a mate he married in his mind the moment he cracked his shell. A sacred promise lost to a future he doesn't know, doesn't exist. Day after day singing for love a life. Finally, the unbearable stretch and strain snapped the strings to his soul, and his heart breaks. The beat stops. The last bead of empty air evaporates into unforgivable silence. Oh, 
superb liar. Deep in the eucalyptus trees of southeastern Australia lives the opera singer of birds, the splendid, spectacular, superb liar, swirling up excitement with swept up mounds of soil, scrap, and twig from the forest floor. An impromptu stage upon which to perform an improvised opera of courtship. Costumed in fine feathered folds of coffee cream, dove gray, and a splash of crimson. A train of lyre-shaped tail feathers, tiger-striped, with tufts at the tips. A silvery cape of cobweb filigree thrown over its back. The lyre sports long, luxurious legs and flexible feet that stomp, strut, sachet, shimmy, and shake. Oh, but when this magnificent mimic opens its beak, out pours a cascade of colors, coos, clicks, trills, trumpets, flutes, hoots, hollers, screams, and seductive serenades, projected far and wide over the forest tops. An expressive verissimo voice, able to sing in all the various languages of other birds heard, hiding in nearby trees. The superb lyre is native to Australia, its descendants stretching far back in time, feather and bone firmly embedded in stone. It has sidestepped the encroaching fires of extinction by refusing to be ignored. Starring in nature films, singing for its supper, and accommodating comfortable captivity impressively well. The superb lyre stands center stage singing for the luckless and the lost. The tiny Romeo who never found love. The doomed passenger pigeon domed in glass. The regal eagle who needs room to breathe, the gullible friendly fellow who tripped and tumbled into extinction. This divine diva sings for them all, from the familiar penguin and parakeet to the forgotten Pio Pio and pink-headed duck. Listen, pay attention to this grand avian opera, every voice essential to the majestic musical tapestry of our earth. For as each voice is pulled, one by one by one, we all unravel. Heed the canary, silent in the mine. Before this silence swallows us all.
I am stricken by this work's representation of Martha, the last passenger pigeon, and it's humbling to think of how quickly a species so numerous that it blocked the sky was reduced to a population of none. Like many groups on Earth, birds face a variety of challenges in the current era of rapid change and human disturbance. To learn more about how you can help this group of species, visit the National Audubon Society's website's How to Help section. Over the course of this Art for the Earth project, we have provided numerous ideas, resources, and actions that each of us can take in our everyday lives. No one can do every single thing, but by choosing an action and getting others to do the same, we can at least get started on the hard work ahead for ourselves and others. The city of Missoula has set the course to becoming Montana's first zero waste community. It's a big endeavor and it will take all of us to achieve the ambitious goal of zero by 50. Check out the website 0x50missoula.com for more information. Here are a few more opportunities for action. 
Let's work together to compost all of our organic materials. As noted here, there are many community resources to help eliminate the waste of organic matter. Once we can gather again, make your next event a zero waste one. Don't know where to start? There's a start to finish zero waste events guide as a free resource on the zero by 50 website. Learn firsthand about zero waste events by volunteering at one of Missoula's beloved gatherings that the zero by 50 green team supports. Think River City Roots, Out to Lunch, or Downtown Tonight, and come celebrate as a zero waste ambassador when they return. Learn about the local businesses that participated in the first We Pledge Zero Waste cohort by checking out their stories on the website and thank them with your support. Zero by 50 Missoula is gearing up to expand that program, so if you're interested in participating in the future, let them know. We need to work together to solve the big problems related to climate change and environmental degradation. The arts have the power to reach into the human heart and help us find common ground. We hope this interdisciplinary project encourages us to respect our interdependence and to use our creativity as a solutions resource. After all, there is no planet B, and we need all hands, minds, and hearts on deck. Please share the Art for the Earth project, and thank you for joining us.